We are on issue number 46 of Nintendo Power for 1993. The Nestor Awards are back, and we have a couple of major titles featured in this issue, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Buster Busts Loose for the Super Nintendo. Considering the games this issue, it's not my first choice for the cover, but it might be my third choice. In the letters column, we have a question on whether there's a code that lets you play as the bosses in Street Fighter 2. Not that Nintendo knows, but I do recall reading about a code that did that very thing in Electronic Gaming Monthly. Our opening game for this issue is Star Fox. The biggest title covered this issue, and one which they've been building up to for months. And this is the game I'd consider to be my first choice for the cover. We have info on the interface and on how power-ups work. There is also an isometric map of the first level, and notes on the game's routes. There's also a note that there'll be more coverage next issue, so I'm holding off on the review until then. Now, the first game we'll be reviewing this issue somewhat is Super Strike Eagle. This is a flight simulator game from Microprose of the Combat Flight Sim variety, as you couldn't tell from the title. The article has notes on gameplay and the interface, including information that you have to land the plane yourself, much as with Top Gun. The camera perspective for the game features two views, a cockpit view for air-to-air -air combat and an external view for bombing runs. So, the issue Nintendo Power doesn't have a control layout for the game. I wasn't able to find a transcription of the manual online or any FAQs with the game's controls, and the game just doesn't give you any options to have more simplified controls to make it easier to land the plane and to control the plane. Which, when you're dealing with a combat flight simulator, is an issue. Top Gun, you're upon the NES controller. It's a very, very simple controller, so it's less of a problem. Here, the, N the controller for the Super Nintendo is complicated enough, and the system itself is complicated enough to do more complicated things with it, as we've seen with Wing Commander which means that you need to be able to see the controls in game, or have them you don't, then you need to have the manual to be able to play. And this game is complicated enough that, well, in short, don't buy this game unless you're buying a copy with a manual. That's pretty much it. Next up is Super Conflict, a hex-based war game. It doesn't leave a story or campaign, just a series of scenarios vaguely linked together. Super Conflict plays like a much more involved version of Advance Wars. Now, the Advance Wars series has a clear-cut sense of paper, rock, scissors to the game's mechanics. This is a little less clear. To be specific, the game is less transparent on what the various stats are for various units and how they relate to each other and how terrain relates to those stats in turn. Now, the thing with playing war games on consoles and on PCs is that, in theory, adding a computer to the mix streamlines all the math and die rolling and makes it easier to and faster to make the sort of tactical decisions that drag down time playing a turn-based miniatures war game or um, piece-based war game on the table or on a sand board or what have you. Thus you're able to make your decisions better and make your decisions faster and also resolve those decisions more quickly. With the exception of the faster resolution process this game doesn't do that. Now, it's entirely possible that all this information was contained in the manual, but I couldn't find manual scans, and the fact I found didn't contain a, rep a complete replication of the information in the manual, so I have to work with what I have. Now, I suspect if I sat down and spent like a good month or whatever, just, just figuring out the mechanics, I could probably get a better understanding just playing by ear of how the game's mechanics works, but I unfortunately don't have the time for that. This is a game I would be interested in sitting down and playing longer term, possibly for a, a Let's Play or something like that, but as it stands now, n not so much. It's not a, it's not grabbing me and making it me it's fascinated in it enough to make it my pick of the game, of the issue. On the other hand, we have Wayne's World, a licensed game based on the film, with Michael Myers and Dana Carvey's digitized likenesses featured in the game. The guide us maps of the first two parts of the first stage. Where to begin with this stupid game? The music is repetitive, the voice samples, while I admit are crisp, they are also grating, and due to making the sprites of the characters large enough to have the likenesses of the characters Wayne and Garth, 
It also means the sprites are too large for the level designs, leading to a whole bunch of cheap hits from enemies and level obstacles. This is a very bad game, and I strongly recommend that you skip it. Next up is our cover game, and our first 16-bit Tiny Toons game, Buster Busts Loose. The article has maps of pretty much the entire game. Buster Busts Loose is a game with well-designed levels with interesting gimmicks and decently controlling gameplay. The game properly gets across the sense of speed that I associate with the movement of Looney Tunes as cartoons characters, much that I associate with jumping with those characters. The levels are very well designed and do a good job on, of training the player on how to play the game. Unfortunately, the boss fights are way longer than they need to be without any real sense of progression and change. You're not changing your tactics partway through the fight because the boss has changed their attack pattern and form, you're just doing the same thing the whole time. I do want to give props to the game for providing a difficulty setting with unlimited continues and the options to take away continues from that part, less continues, and also less possible health, both minimum and maximum, based on how difficult the player wants to make the game. That's the way you do it if you're going to do limited continues. You make it a challenge that the player imposes upon themselves while they are learning the game, or after they've learned it. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Wing Commander, abandons his wingman, and gets shot down and captured. Lesson learned here, don't forget your wingman. That's actually something that's probably worth teaching to people who've never played this sort of fight sim before with a wingman. Our last Super Nintendo title this issue is King Arthur's World. I describe this in short as Medieval Lemmings. The article has notes on the job types and the tutorial levels of the game. While mechanically this game is similar to Lemmings, and that is a title which has the player using a variety of units with different abilities to solve various problems, in this case tactical combat, with the player's control being related to giving specific commands at specific times in a real-time environment, much as with Lemmings. However, this game is really slow to play and to control, which means that it takes a long time for you to get any meaningful feedback as to what you've been doing wrong in the game, and when you screw up on an early attempt at the level and have to restart, it takes you a very long time to get back to where you were. By comparison, Lemmings moves very fast, and is consequently much more enjoyable as a puzzle game. It also lets you reset more easily and get back to where you were more quickly when you screw up. In the classified information column, we get a stage select code for Wing Commander. In this issue's installment of the Star Fox comic, the team thwarts a freighter hijacking before doing some training on their R-Wings, training that strays into Imperial space. Moving into Game Boy titles, Adventure Island 3 for the NES has been re-released for the Game Boy as Adventure Island 2. The guide is a complete overhead map, along with power-up notes and notes on the first world. We might as well talk about what this game does right. With a couple of exceptions, it gets the size of the sprites with the si scale of the game screen correct, and it gives passwords whenever you get a game over, and it gives unlimited continues, though the game does not, unfortunately, give a save screen or any other way to access your current password on the overworld map. Further, on the bright side, when you continue, you continue almost exactly where you left off in the game. However, it has those little frustrating Adventure Island issues that make the games just that little bit more obnoxious than they need to be. Bosses that take too many hits with no real feedback on how much more fighting you need to do. Enemies who run up behind you with no warning except for whether you've ap appropriately memorized the level. And eggs which contain occasional booby prizes that drop your health or timer rapidly and which don't make themselves known until you've acquired them and shooting eggs acquires them as opposed to every other time when you shoot an egg which shows just what's inside. Still, it's a decent enough game, but it has its very real flaws, flaws which are endemic to the Adventure Island series. Continuing with the ports of NES games for the Game Boy, we have a port of Mylon Secret Castle. The article has a rundown of the tools you need for the game, and notes on each of the doors in the castle. Well, Mylon's Secret Castle plays exactly the way it did on the NES. That's not a good thing. Mylon's Secret Castle was a terrible, terrible game which used random shooting of the level environment to extend day gameplay in a dull, tedious manner. Putting the game in a, in, and the, its mechanics 
into a title that's meant to be played on the go somehow doesn't make this better. In fact, it makes it quite the opposite, it makes it worse. I would have hoped that they'd fix some of this stuff, they'd fix the random shooting, they have made it more intuitive and let it be something that you could play better on the go. Made a superior version of the NES title, particularly considering that the NES game was a very early title on the system. The fact that they changed pretty much nothing, mechanically, is unfortunate. Continuing with the ports, we have a port of Krusty's Funhouse with general gameplay notes. Acclaim managed to get the perspective of the port right, which is again, way more important than you'd think. The controls also work fairly well, though the jump is a bit much, but that's not the fundamental point of the game, it's a platformer. Well, it's not a platformer, it's a puzzle game, with a little bit of jumping and platforming elements as you make your way through the levels. As a Lemmings-inspired puzzler, the game works surprisingly well as a portable title. The puzzles are put together in nice, reasonably sized, bite-sized chunks, with passwords after each one, which works for what you're trying to do in the game. Props for a client. This is a game I would seriously consider picking up if I came across a copy of it. And the ports roll on with a port of the NES version of Empire Strikes Back. This is not a good game. The field of view is okay, it's a little too close, and the levels are structured kind of poorly for something that's meant to be played on a handheld. The levels maintain the same size and scope as the NES version, which is impressive, and it's fine when you're playing it on TV, and it's, again, it's impressive that they managed to pull this off on a handheld. But on the TV, you can take the time to explore and draw a map which you can have with you or have a Nintendo Power open on your lap while you're playing the game. But when you're playing on the go, potentially in fits and starts, it really doesn't work as well. Further, the game has only one life per continue and a limited number of continues, which is something I've never liked with console games and I like even less on handheld games. In Counselor's Corner, we have a recommended boss order for Mega Man 5 on the NES. Moving into the NES titles, we have the NES version of Alien 3, which is a proper side-scroller, but not quite in the Castlevania 2 inspired open-world style used in the Super Nintendo version. Alien 3 doesn't play quite the same way that the Super Nintendo version does, but it is, thus far, one of the best games to come out of LJN of all time. And before you make quips about this being damning with faint praise, this game is legitimately solid. As an example, the first level of the game has you, as Ripley, rescuing a group of nine inmates in a portion of the prison complex, then having to reach the exit within a time limit. In earlier titles for this console, this would be a royal pain in the ass, as it required you to memorize the exact layout of the level and where everything is before you actually figured out what you needed to do in order to complete the game. However, Alien 3 improves on this dramatically by showing you, when you fail, exactly where the prisoners you needed to find were. Best of all, it just doesn't do this by showing blinking dots on a map. Instead, the game moves the camera through the level, so you can see the level graphics and find the landmarks that you can use to proceed in the game to do what you need to do. If I have one complaint, it's that because the time limit is for how long until the prisoners get face huggered. It'd be nice if once you've freed all the prisoners, the time limit stopped and you had unlimited time to reach the exit, for example, but that's pretty much it. We now come to the last NES Dragon Warrior game with Dragon Warrior 4, which would be my other pick for the cover of this issue. This game was released for the Nintendo DS as Dragon Quest 4 Chapters of the Chosen, which is the version I own of this game. The guide isn't as complete as the earlier guides, but it does give notes for each chapter, providing guidance along with general gameplay notes for the game as a whole. Dragon Warrior 4 is an epic game, and I don't just mean that in a overblown, hyperbolic fashion. It's a game with a very significant scope, probably some of the biggest scope of the Dragon Quest series as a whole, or at least the 8-bit console versions. And it's a very decent, not just decent, an excellent swan song for the 8-bit version of the franchise. 
The game also focuses a lot more on a character driven narrative, as the story follows a variety of chapters, each focusing on a, on a different protagonist with their own motivations and their own desires and goals that you have to accomplish before all these characters join together in it for the final quest to defeat the evil overlord. This makes for the biggest transition point in Dragon Warrior as a franchise, going from a party that was pretty much a blank slate that you as a player could project your own narrative on, telling a story about characters, each maybe not very well fleshed out, but each somewhat fleshed out with their own, again, objectives and goals and why they're doing what they're doing. Which is something that, for example, when this came out in Japan, Final Fantasy hadn't quite done yet. Final Fantasy II for the Famicom sort of did something like this, by having the band of rebels with your characters being survivors of a village attacked by the evil empire, but this really didn't come to the forefront as a narrative-focused element until 1991 with Final Fantasy IV on the Super Nintendo or Super Famicom. Now, Fi Dragon Warrior uh, 4, on the other hand, came out for the Famicom in 1990. However, unfortunately for US gamers, these came out in reverse order, so we didn't get them the, the same escalation, and thus, by comparison, I suspect Dragon Warrior 4, from a narrative standpoint, felt, well, lackluster and like a Johnny Come Lately compared to Final Fantasy, when it may be the other way around. Next, we have Mickey's Safari in Letterland a Disney edutainment game that appears to not be developed by Capcom. The article has general gameplay notes, and as with many of the other grade school level edutainment games, this title is getting skipped. Our last title of the issue is Widget, a environmental themed licensed platformer based on a Saturday morning cartoon. We don't get level maps, but we do get gameplay notes. Widget is not a well done game. It could be executed better. It's a very run-and-gun style platformer, except your sprite is too big to avoid some of the shots coming your way, and your shots are too weak to deal with the enemies you face in a reasonable length of time. Additionally, some enemies, when shot instead of bouncing back, bounce forwards towards the player. The game also takes a shape-changing mechanic from the show, where Widger could change his form as needed for the obstacles that he faced but the different forms you can use here aren't particularly effective, so I can't particularly recommend picking up this game. Our next feature article is a developer and publisher profile of Capcom, giving a list of their titles from 1984 to 1993, and focusing primarily on the US branch of the company, instead of covering the Japanese branch and, you know, the actual designers and developers of their games. We've got the nominees for the 1992 Nesters, and with it are my picks, which are as follows. For graphics and sound, my picks are Link to the Past for the NES, Super Mario Land 2 for the Game Boy, and Mega Man 4 for the NES. For the categories of theme and fun, and the category of play control, my picks are Street Fighter 2 for the NES, Mario Land 2 for the Game Boy, and, once again, Mega Man 4 for the NES. For challenge, my picks are... Super Smash TV for the Super Nintendo, Bionic Commando for the Game Boy, and Dragon Warrior 4 for the NES. This is the only category that Dragon Warrior 4 was nominated for outside of the best overall category. For best hero, as Ryu is not nominated, I'm going with Chun-Li with Link a close second. For best villain, my pick is Wario. For most innovative, my pick is Super Faceball 2000, as it is the first 16-bit console first-person shooter. For best sports game, my pick is Madden 93. Finally, for best overall, my picks are Street Fighter 2 for the Super Nintendo, Super Mario Land 2 for the Game Boy, and Dragon Warrior 4 for the NES. Of note in the top 20 of this issue, Tecmo Super Bowl is on top of the charts for the NES, Kirby has entered the top 3 for the Game Boy, and Mario Kart is in the top three for the Super Nintendo. In the now playing column for this issue, of note among the also rans is Where in Time is Carmen San Diego, and Ultimate Fighter, no related to relation to the mixed martial arts organization, for the Super Nintendo. In the Pack Watch column, 
Of note among the upcoming titles are Super Bomberman, which comes with a multi-tap that allows for four-player gameplay, and Pocky and Rocky for the Super Nintendo. For the NES, we also have Kirby's Adventure to look forward to. Wrapping up this issue, we have a special report from CES. Of note in the pictures this issue is a terrifying Mega Man mascot costume and a Goomba from the horrible Super Mario Bros. movie. My pick of this issue is Dragon Warrior 4, or Dragon Quest 4, in whatever form you can get it. It really is the point, where Dragon Quest 4 is, where the Dragon Quest franchise becomes much more enjoyable from a narrative perspective. There's still a certain degree of grind there, but you have a level of characterization in the game which makes for a more entertaining and engrossing story. With Buster's Busts Loose for the Super Nintendo coming in a close second, where they kind of get the formula of the... Saturday morning cartoon Looney Tunes inspired platformer right. Next time, we finally get to Star Fox. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.